So just as a summary of what we're here for today, creativity is widely recognised as essential for the ongoing progression of contemporary societies. And this is illustrated by the World Economic Forum ranking creativity as a skill of increasing importance and an IBM study of 1500 CEOs that has identified creativity as the most important skill for leaders. This message has been keenly felt in Singapore with headlines such as creativity, the key to nation's future growth and Singapore graduates facing creativity gap, rallying the nation to enhance creativity. Yet creativity is often understood as quite an ambiguous concept that is out of reach for many. What is creativity and how do we nurture it in Singapore and Australian contexts? Here to help us explore this question are our panel members. And I now introduce each in turn before they do their presentations. So first, help me welcome Associate Professor Anne Harris, who is a Principal Research Fellow and Associate Professor at RMIT University in Melbourne. Associate Professor Harris is the Vice-Chancellor's Principal Research Fellow and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow, 2017-2021, studying intercultural creativity. Anne is also the Director of Creative Agency, a transdisciplinary research lab at RMIT <coughs> University, focusing on creativity and creative making practices bringing together a community of artists and scholars for social change. Anne is an honorary research fellow at the University of Nottingham, UK, and an adjunct professor at Monash University, Australia. She has worked professionally as a playwright, dramaturge, and teaching artist in the USA and Australia, has published over 100 academic articles, chapters, and 16 books, and is the creator and series editor of the Polgrave book series, Creativity, Education and the Arts. Associate Professor Anne Harris. Welcome. Our next presenter, Dr. Esther Juicer, arts education consultant, director of pedagogy with Playum. Esther Juicer is originally from the Netherlands. As art education consultant, she pursues the arts and play as a fundamental human social and semiotic practice. She designed the standards for the arts in special education in Singapore and designed the visual arts curricula of two special schools. As director of pedagogy with Playm, she co-curated an interactive play art exhibition featuring the installations of disabled artists and leads the research open minds, open doors, investigating the value of unstructured, artful play of children with disabilities. Welcome. And finally, our very own Dr. Louise Gwyneth Phillips, Senior Fellow, Higher Education Academy. Dr. Phillips is an Associate Professor in Education at James Cook University here in Singapore. Her career spans theatre in education, early childhood education, storytelling, environmental education, children's rights and citizenship research, and arts-based research methodologies. She's particularly interested in story as theory and method, as illustrated broadly through creative pedagogies and methodologies, and more specifically through co-authoring the Routledge book, Research Through, With and As Storying with Tracy Bunda, a Guru woman from Queensland who is Professor and Head of the College for Indigenous Studies, Education and Research at the University of Southern Queensland. Welcome. And so now without further ado, I would like to invite the two, two co-speakers to sit with me and I'll introduce Anne sure. to take it off away from here. Okay. Okay, great. Well, welcome wherever you're from. Um, yeah, I, I hope that this, uh, that this talk today is useful to you. It does go into a bit of theory, creative studies theory, um, and it's, it's sort of, um, it also talks about a study that I'm doing at the moment. We were just at La Salle last night doing a, a, a devised performance around the portion of my study that's looking at uh, creativity and creative practice in Singapore. So that was sort of the applied version. And I'm giving a couple of talks at SIM on um, Saturday in a workshop on how to actually do it 
we're, we're going to talk about what is creativity, but also how to how to enact that in your context, whether they're <coughs> arts context or education context or whatever. So today, I'm going to look a little bit at definitions and how we might think differently about creativity from an individual to a sort of collective trait or process. So I hope it's helpful. OK, so for years now, educators and business folks have been trying to build a model for growing creativity, a recipe. But creativity is defiant. It's mercurial. It comes late to the party and leaves early. It gets lost and ends up at the beach. Models are not muses. Rubrics are not relationships. So today I'm going to briefly outline some problems with using prepackaged models for fostering creativity in your context. This is a, a popular direction that lots and lots of people are going. So I'm going to have a little poke at that. And then I'm going to share my approach, which I call creative ecologies. OK, first, probably the uh, most well-known model at this point in, in the world. The most well-known one is design thinking. So how many people have heard of design thinking? OK, about half. Design thinking is a, is a formula, the condensing of a complex and skilled process of design into a narrow problem-solving equation. It was pioneered at a design firm called IDEO and commodified in Silicon Valley. That's in California uh, in the States, right? So IDEO partner Michael Hendricks has said that part of the problem, quote unquote, is that many uh, uh, people use design thinking in superficial ways. He calls it a theater of innovation. So it's a performance of innovation. But is it really innovation? I guess that's what he's asking. Companies know they need to be more creative and innovative. Um, and because they're looking for fast ways to achieve these goals, they cut corners. Design thinking or other models like it, like Intel uh, Corporation's 4Cs model, which some of you may also have heard of, have a limited application because their cookie cutter templates and superficial uptake can never be responsive enough to all diverse contexts. Creativity and innovation are by definition outside of the box, right? So why would you make a box to grow it? Stanford University's D-Lab, the beating heart of worldwide design thinking, now charges over 13,000 US dollars for a four-day boot camp. So why wouldn't we work harder at making our own creative environments and then letting passionate people here in Singapore and elsewhere loose within them? Investing in our own ecologies uh, rather than going halfway around the world and paying someone else to learn theirs, right? Because branding, because people want to say they've been to D-Lab. Schools and companies and design students want to say that. And fair enough, because it makes people go, wow, you went to D-Lab. <laughs> but we need to be braver than that. There's a famous creativity scholar called Shiksumihai, some of you may have heard of, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him. So extending Shiksumihai and Kerrigan and others' work on systems theory in creativity, I advocate a notion of creative ecologies, and that's what a lot of my work is about. Shiksumihai is concerned with the social context in which creativity is expressed, uh, combining person, domain, and field. In the 1980s, he found that the existence of wealthy patrons, competitions, awards, and commissions attracted artists to an area, which then resulted in a vibrant community, attracting more artists and creatives into what I call a creative ecology. So Chiksumihai's focus on time and place asks the question, where is creativity, rather than the more usual, what is creativity, which is what a lot of people are asking these days. So I didn't make up the notion of creative ecology, but I've adapted it to education contexts. All creative work is not collective or collaborative, despite the current focus on building this kind of creative skill, particularly in education. So thinking about establishing creative ecologies or environments rather than trying to teach collaboration, which may make students collaborative, but not necessarily creative, is one way to make the conditions for creativity in holistic, 
but unique ways responsive to the opportunities and constraints of each environment. One of the texts that I use a lot in my work and has influenced me and my current research in particular is this book, is a book by Quan Xing Chen called Asia's Method. Chen argues that Eurocentric frameworks are insufficient for examining the interconnectedness of the history, culture, and politics of Asian societies. And I would argue the Asian region, which includes Australia. Chen talks about an inter-Asian perspective that says we have the unique ability to understand, research, and see our own regional specificities in ways that no one else can. So Australia, even as a so-called white country in this region, is significantly different in outlook and culture to its European or American majority white cultures due to our, our unique position here in the Asia Pacific. So in this book, Chen demands a decolonizing and de-imperialist uh, approach to research, culture, uh, conversations, and education. That is, we should be doing our own research from our own points of view. I extend this into creativity studies, uh, and particularly into education. So firstly, we have to integrate our individual and regional identity into our creativity reform. And secondly, we need to think more uh, like systems than individuals. So this is the creative ecologies in some of the books that I've written about it. And this is going, uh, getting us back now to Csikszentmihalyi's focus on where is creativity rather than that question of what. So basically, the, the principle here is looking at a location or an environment which it in includes a set of different actants in it and a network. It's, it's part of a network approach or a systems theory approach. OK, let's go to Hawkins, the next one. John Hawkins, and now I'm going to jump back to some, uh, a quote that's talking about the UK and the United States, so I apologize for that. But the facts are uh, uh, being played out all around the globe, including here in our region. So John Hawkins has also formulated a notion of creative ecologies, but as I was saying before, uh, he thinks and writes firmly from an economic and business point of view. And one of the things he's written is this quote here, and I will read it to you. So according to the McKinsey consultancy firm, in 2007, so I admit that's a while ago, but the trend is the same, 2007, over 46% of jobs in Britain and over 40% of American jobs required the employee to exercise his or her creativity in ways that qualify for intellectual property. Even more striking is McKinsey's estimate that 70% of new American jobs require such creative judgment. And as you were saying in the opening, um, it's higher today. This figure refers not to 70% uh, 70, 70 of jobs in the arts and sciences, but to all jobs. This is the reality of what I call the creative ecology, he says. In my work, this is Hawkins, on the creative ecology, it's become clear that learning is the most common and widely shared uh, characteristic of creative people, from the genius to the journeyman. Creative people may differ in everything else, but they are all persistent endless learners. So my question to you is, but what do we do in education contexts in which learners are not all curious, much less creative, and don't have this natural inclination to persistently, endlessly learn? Unlike Hawkins, Charles Landry revives some of the individual collective intersections of Chiksamahai's domain, person, and field, and comes closest to my notion of building creative environments or ecologies in learning contexts. So now we're starting to talk about um, education. He theorizes creative cities in much the way I think about creative education spaces, and that includes communities, not just physical spaces. Landry says, to be creative means uh, change changing the organizational culture um, of a city. It means creating the conditions within which people can think, plan, and act with imagination. It means there needs to be, uh, need to be creative individuals, organizations, and communities, as well as creative education and training. This environment can then establish a creative milieu and develop a creative ecology. Yet schools continue to resist more collaborative approaches often because they conflict with the established silo structure, particularly in secondary schools and some university models. Education as a sector still focuses 
largely on the individual. So my work uh, charts how individual experience now needs to expand into a more linked up relationship between micro and macro approaches to improving the creative ecosystems or what Csikszentmihalyi and Anna Kraft called big C and little c creativity and Csikszentmihalyi and Simonton have called the relationship between the individual and the field. If an increasing number of national economic policies state the centrality of creativity to their regional and national agendas, as we heard in the introduction, the macro of creative education uh, is clearly linked to economic policy and the need for globally mobile creative forces, workforces. So that's fine, but the micro of education policy and the need for globally mobile creative uh, uh, workforces um, uh, extends to education policy and curricular approaches, uh, which fail that goal at both the individual and collective levels. So maybe partly it's a communication breakdown between the uh, micro and the macro, but it also looks like a failure to take a sufficiently systems or systemic approach that considers the school site, the school system, relationships, partnerships, and national education, and uh, economy strategies overall as a whole ecosystem that requires change, not just in the micro context of defining, assessing, or teaching a skill. And too often in education, discourses in research and in schools, professional development, we're still talking about it as a, a skill, an individual skill or capacity. Okay, scholars continue to conceptualize creativity in education as a thing to be done, a thing to be measured. What if we move from this mentality to a creative ecology, ecological one based on Csikszentmihalyi's question, where is creativity? Sort of like a caterer sets the space for a great party, or a director makes the empty space for a performance to emerge. Creativity is playful encounter, one of the central purposes of my uh, research lab, Creative Agency, in Melbourne. What we try and do there is ask, how do we foster unpredictable creative possibilities, encounters, play dates, environments, in education context, contexts? which rely on the predictable, in fact, demand the predictable most of the time. So if we begin to think in education about creativity as the emergent, or what Anna Kraft calls the trusteeship of ideas, creativity can be celebrated for its resilient qualities, its refusal to be harnessed, its resilient attachment to new ideas. In a creative ecology, creative individuals are catalysts for whole system change and creativity does not all look the same. So this is my current Australian Research Council funded study, 21st century creativity in Australia and Asia. I'm about halfway through that study now. And I'm using Chen's principles of thinking like Asia as method, and it marries that to the creative ecologies model that I've just talked about. So it's really looking at how we can do um, lots of different diverse research from this region, um, from all our different countries, <clears throat> but with the commonality of our, our regional uh, neighborliness, our relationship, our geographical relationship at the very least, um, and start to talk about how we conceive of creativity, how we do creativity, and what role it's playing in our economies and cultures. Uh, it looks at sociocultural creativity patterns across East Asia, including Australia, and the study argues that there are benefits to working in a networked, intercultural and regional way, as I was just saying, toward con context-specific creative skills and strengths, not always just at the uniformly and mostly white Western global way. So I guess what I'm saying there is the whole kind of language of creativity or creative industries, creative economies is dominated by a white Western kind of view, uh, definition, and series of practices that are considered to be global ones and that, uh, 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 you know, we, we, that we need to do more work in our region to identify the ways in which we may or may not do things differently here. Um, okay, so the study uh, uh, looks at, uh, it's not all about innovation for innovation's sake, which is not, we're coming to understand, sustainable on a planetary, national, or individual level. So one of our Singaporean interview participants had um, this to say earlier this year. 
And I think the next slide. Okay, so sh they said, I mean, I mean, I mean, we need to be innovators and creators, so now that's the arts. You can debate that. That's Singapore. I lament that art was not developed, especially in primary and secondary schools, for just developing the human. One of the ministers said recently at a talk that while we are leading in PISA scores, people know what PISA scores are? Yeah. Um, we have not much innovation to show for it. So obviously PISA is not a good measure for the success of a country because we are developed, so we have developed world problems. We're now to an extent like the US. We're not very cheap um, uh, for manufacturing. We're expensive. And then we have land scarcity, and we have a shortage of manpower. The way forward for us is essentially creative innovation in all aspects of industry, but we're not doing that either. So we could talk about that quote later if you want to. <laughs> That's one person's view. We've interviewed lots of people in each site. But I, I chose that quote because I think that it is essentially a very universal view uh, and maybe problem that we're grappling with now in education, which is our kind of addiction to standardization and global measures, and at the same time uh, ascribing to this idea that we do have to train our young people for creative workforce and all that goes along with it, and the two things are kind of working against each other. OK, so what does that look like? Well, that's the big question that everybody's grappling with now. Only this week, Tesla, you know the Tesla, Tesla Motors? Tesla inventor Elon Musk raised new fears about AI, which he says, quote, will beat humanity at everything by as soon as 2030 or 2040. Also debatable, we can talk about that after. <laughs> creativity scholars are urging us to think about creativity as something more than innovation. Creativity as stewardship, as intercultural glue, as inherently enriching our lives, and as our best weapon against the factionalism of religion, nationalism, and growing social inequalities. It's worth taking note when one of the most successful developers of new technology warns us that, and this is a quote from Musk, he says, artificial intelligence, intelligence isn't necessarily bad, but it will separate uh, it will operate outside of human control. It's going to be very tempting to use AI as a weapon. At least when there's an evil dictator, that human is going to die, he says. For artificial intelligence, there will be no death. It would live forever, and then you have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. Heavy. So once again, it's not unique though, once again, the human race finds itself at the dark edges of our creative capacities, limited only by intention. And as in previous generations, with the development of automation, of the atomic bomb, of chemical warfare, we should be gathering here today, in my view, not to consider how to define or measure creativity, but how to create the conditions for ethical and relational creative ecologies in ways that bring us together rather than more apart. And I'm asking all of you here today, are we paying enough attention to that? And I think the answer through that uh, creative uh, um, uh, ecology model is that we have to do it in a networked way. So on to the conclusion. So let me close by stating the obvious. The most helpful research on creativity I have found stresses how perfectly positioned we are to celebrate the value of our own unique cultural contexts. And I urge you to think about that in terms of Singapore too, uh, rather than adopting foreign models or other standardized models. So the question is what can we, you, here in Singapore bring creatively that no one else can to that global landscape? It requires shifting the gaze to the creative ecologies in which we are all already operating and humanizing them rather than standardizing them. Standardization has proven not to improve lives or the workforce, so why are we still addicted to it? It could be in, try, in tying our entrepreneurial work, which I admit is required now, to big ideas for the planet. It's one of the reasons why, in my view, Elon Musk has been so successful. 
Sustainable energy, maybe, for us. Safe art uh, artificial intelligence, the brain-computer interface, human habitation on other planets, or just plain joy in doing science or the arts. Good creativity research and education reminds us that it's not about the individual versus the ecology or the group or the larger environment. Not about winning or losing or about ranking yourself in your high school, your country, or even international scales. That is the opposite of creativity. It's about saying no to that mentality and trying things more aligned with today's opportunities in the here and now. So as a mentor said to me early in my career, boldness is rewarded. So failure is not really the enemy. Not trying is the enemy. In creative work and innovation too, our failures can often be the prompt for the next creative visionary to make that idea work or our own next um, uh, idea to work better. Nothing in the fullness of time is wasted. We have a human need not only to innovate, but to pursue better futures for ourselves and for our families. We know that creativity is always a relational ecology, that creative action is tied to big ideas with the potential to turn us away from a fear of the future and return, return us to asking, what is possible if? Thank you very much. I'm so happy and went first, not because I'm not afraid to go first, but she set so nicely the pace for where I'm going to latch on to her. And especially your quotes about Chen and to, to find an entry into, into that whole ecology of learning. There's so much happening in the ecology of creativity. I am coming in from a very uh, interesting perspective because one group of people is absolutely not mentioned in creativity. And those are people with a disability. They are out of the equation. And yet, and yet, um, creativity is, is seeing things from a different perspective. And I have come to see in my work how much is there. Currently I have an exhibition uh, inspired by people and co-created by people with a disability. It's not a charitable, it's not a poor thing thing. It is a thing whereby literally different doors open. I have a white space, a Clement space, which is designed by an autistic artist. She wants to be mentioned, autistic artist. The Clement space is a space of silence, of quiet. How many of us dare to create a space of silence, of quiet? This is where we get new perspectives. You're not something else. We have a young man, an autistic artist who designed who draws two-dimensional but if you fold it up it becomes three-dimensional. He allows us to see top, bottom, left, under. These are things. I have an artist with Down syndrome who drums with paint but if you collage it together it becomes a new canvas but we all can create new canvases. I have a poet with Down syndrome who writes so amazing that we learn to see the world again the way it is leaves that, go, that, that move, ask us to inspire, where does inspiration come from? You know, we tend to see in design thinking from a standard perspective, and I'm so glad you raised that purpose. So Open Minds, Open Doors introduces you to my research of children with a disability engaged in unstructured play. So the question what play is for? What is its link to creativity and what purpose does it serve is a loaded question and I've seen ample dialogue through the ages. Uh, we don't see a purpose, but then what is play and creativity for individuals with special needs is even more loaded because until today little is known about them as creative, agentic beings. They're literally out of it and yet uh, for play is about therapy. You need to learn how to play. Uh, creativity is non-existent and parent teachers are anxious. More anxious than even the typical parent in Singapore. Now that is bad. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, and by the way, I've been here 31 years. I have three Singaporean sons. 
and I've been educating here for a long time. So contemporary literature studies are playing creativity in mainstream education. They draw attention to the importance to open up our minds and doors. <coughs> to search for opportunities, to nurture 21st century skills. But how do we do that? How do we give through creativity, voice, ownership, meaning making and participation? Now, I may focus on children with a disability, but actually it matters to all. So the research methodology and methods. I am a, well, it depends on my mood, how I think, but <laughs> <laughs> most of the time I think very social constructivist, although I put in there very critical elements, but that is the mood and the perspective I write on. The search for a method is really the most difficult and it's one of the most important problems because that allows us to see how we want to understand the unique human form of psychological activity and in this case creativity. Understanding is simultaneously the prerequisite as the product and you mentioned uh, the beginning and the end I don't know whether you have the alpha and the omega. As, is that yours? No. Somebody here has alpha omega as a, as a um, link. But I have always been relating to the beginning and the end. These are things we need to really consider. So research is for me both the method and the tool, as well as for programs. In short, the why informs the what, the how, but also vice versa. It's a complex process. So, and the problems to me lead to the solution and often the solution leads to new problems. Yes. So, the questions. Uh, yeah, we need to set our research and this research is supported by NCSS, the National Council for Social Services. It was an initiative to which they gave us a, a grant. So, it was the question first, how does regular engagement in open-ended play and a creative environment aid a progress, understanding, development, execution of 21st century skills, which are communication, creativity, critical thinking, communication, there are more, these are the four primary, for children with different needs and from different backgrounds. How can the research methodology and use of visual methods define the framework to create insights into the theoretical and empirical relationship of play and this development, and how does evidence of the child's engagement in this <coughs> open-ended play creative program support parents' expectations of their child with a disability? Now, we focus especially on the parent, because if we don't work with parents from young in the creative processes, there is also the need uh, to grow with, with time. You can only grow with time if you learn about a child. The child cannot grow with you. We have to grow with the child. That's a very complex perspective, but only if we go down, we stay. We stay there. I am who I am today because of my sons. And hopefully they will be who they are because of their children or if their partners or whatever children. So new knowledge we're looking for. We're looking for insights. Like Chen says, you know, we need to get into the Asian context as well. You know, we cannot keep borrowing. We need a method and a skill to transfer our ideas and to change our ideas perhaps. And we need our attitudes towards play and creativity. And we need partnerships. So here is my steps, it is to be a very stepwise approach where I move into the problem with different, with not much known. I had to seek familiarity. I had to, we have to find what is happening and platforms like today, what Louise and Denise have organized and where Anne is here, allows us to come together and get you as an audience to give us feedback. This is very vital to get familiarity about the issue, about literature. Then we shape our ideas. And I'm going to show you a little bit about my findings so far. So far, the program has run for 30, 40 weeks uh, since March. And we have quite amazing findings. So 
where did we start? We started with a convenience sample. What else can you do? That means we go to organizations and we ask, can you work with us? And surprisingly, we had about 30 participants, 40 participants. Um, I had a need to have a minimum attendance of 10 sessions to be included in the research. Uh, I had about 35 people and currently I have about 15 participants more than 10 weeks. So I have met my criteria. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> uh, they have diverse abilities. I have seen different levels of autism, Down syndrome. I also have currently a girl who has clown disease, which is a very rare genetic disorder whereby the skin sheds about a thousand times faster than it's supposed to shed. And when she was born, because her hands were encapsulated, the hands dropped off, it is quite a, a horrific sight. And I will share with you later that Actually, these are important aspects of creativity as well. Uh, creativity evokes somehow kindness. Uh, we have children with multiple uh, disabilities, so global developmental delay, everything. We also needed the parents' willingness uh, to be engaged through interviews and surveys and the consent. So the ethics is part of also research. So the research focus. Now, I have only one question for creativity. Tell me, what would you like to do today? <clears throat> and that is such an important question. How many times do we hear someone asking you, so what would you like to do today? Especially in institutionalized or organized Singapore, whereby children are in infant care from six weeks onwards. How many children here, what would you like to do today? What problems would you like to solve? Or, or no problems, must there be a problem? You know the question, what matters to you? I think this is an essence of human life. And that question is very powerful. So. The effect of regular involvement in a play in a creative environment with the question, tell me what would you like to do, stimulated a whole lot of things. It stimulated the research methodology. It stimulated the practices. It stimulated knowledge and attitudes because we got insights in what matters to those, to the child. And mind you, we're dealing with two to 12 year olds. You try on your grandchildren one question. What would you like to do today? When was the last time you asked that? <laughs> last, last night. Ah, uh, no, that does not be what you want to eat today. No, 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 no. I, I asked, what do you want to play today? Ah, so what did he say? Or she? Snake and Edda. Nice. And who won? <laughs> ah. Snake and ladder. And what if you would have said, you know what? I can't remember the game. Oh, and I can't remember where I put it. <laughs> Can we do something else? What would happen? She would put it back to the number one. <laughs> ah, she put it back because to... Because she always wants to win. <laughs> ah, oh, okay, okay. So here we go. We saw 21st century skills coming out and we saw attitudes and character qualities coming in. Really interesting what was happening. We saw originality of ideas and suggestions. We saw communication <coughs> coming up and we saw all these things happening. So basically, over time, we saw from a broad picture of their engagement in space, we saw a focused attention, interactions with others and specific materials, and we saw individual cases coming out, mm -hmm. stories, individual lives. Each day was another day that not just, a there wasn't tragedy, there was joy, mm -hmm. there was celebration, there was fun, there were hilarious moments that were coming in. So the power of research in practice and creativity is needed, especially in Singapore, to show that 
play and creativity are worthwhile pursuits. Yeah? It is a memory between you and your granddaughter that she will come later, I played with my grandmother. It's a memory you create. These are things that come in. It may not have been, but she was creative maybe in cheating, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can actually see. So these are wonderful things. It doesn't come when you do a workshop, worksheet. It becomes a monologue, do this, make sure you finish. Don't write like that. It becomes something yeah, I don't know. So this is basically how we worked. It's like anybody wants to ask later, we can do that. It's, I want to pass this. It's a process, you know. It's a very processed uh, work. But let me tell you one thing. Videos were very powerful. The videos and understanding how people move in space is something we need more to understand about a person's intent. There is a lot where we move to and how we move that often gives us information. Like for all these talks, have you ever noticed nobody sits at the front seat? <laughs> it's almost like ghost month. <laughs> Lucky we have you sitting here. <laughs> uh, during Singapore seven months, you know, the first <laughs> row is normally left for our ancestors. Now we don't want that to happen. <laughs> the ones who've passed on. Uh, yeah, so here comes my findings. Now, the creative environment is what is its state's place. Mind you, this only happened in, happens in one particular space. I cannot say, but if we want to replicate it, say I want to go to Australia to N or whatever, or we want to go into a school, we can see the creative environment as our background. And what is happening in there is the way it's being set up, it's the materials available, and I know that uh, Louise is very focused on interaction with materials, and let me tell you, it's vital. So it bridges from the broad picture to the very small picture. Within that, we saw each individual, each individual's intent and individual authority starting to come out. So we are not dealing that I'm saying everybody's intent is that. No, but everybody has an intent. And everybody started to have an individual authority within a creative space. And that is a vital part that you can say, I do this within a freedom. Then comes the interest, ideas, and choice of activity. Each individual had their own individual choices, depending on interest age. Then comes the interactions between materials and peers. And we also f saw what was happening. There was no boundary between non-disabled and disabled peers. The interesting part is that within a creative environment, children do not see disability. Wow. And they respectfully take each other ideas. So how much can creativity do? Then we saw, and the R should be there, but I didn't stretch it enough, mm -hmm. influences of the interlocutor. Now an interlocutor is a sensitive adult who responds. Many times in the beginning, I had to pluck away people because they treat people as objects of charity and they start mothering them and I say no in a creative environment we give people the space to come to you that doesn't mean we don't have rules no no uh, you know I have a very clear rule that you have to clean up uh, I, when you finish uh, we had one boy with autism it was really I had to give him the rule marker sit down scissors sit down it's but currently he is completely independent. This is a safety. There's a difference between safety and rules. Uh, influence of the interlocutor is that children needed a specific dose of freedom. Oh, sorry, sorry. And those are the ones that are visible. Less visible were the overall context and events. We have to see that whatever we do is really bound also in creativity, by what is needed in a particular concept, like now, I need my glasses. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
cultural values and policies, we currently see very much the Singapore government focusing on creativity, so much so that people jump on the bandwagon without clearly thinking through what is needed in creative enterprise. We see children in early childhood playing in small blocks of 15 minutes, not realizing that they may need a whole day or more days. We see all these big ideas there, but not paying attention to the small details of that. We see that we don't, we don't discuss much, much enough about it. And I realize that there's so much to be done. We look at stakeholders' beliefs and emotions. I want to tell you about that, beliefs and emotions. I look at the mood in the play creative space. What is the mood? Like, is there a freedom, a liberty? Is, are there spaces where you can withdraw? There is so much going on in life. Anyway, I can talk about this for ages. So, I can tell you here what really happened. What appeared was that children with autism, initially a lot of movement in space, trying to make sense of the environment. For children with Down syndrome and cognitive impairment, there was initially no movement staying in space. But what gradually happened was children with autism staying longer in space, less movement and focus on emergent ideas and relationships. And their true creativity and ideas came out. They were the ones who used the whole space to start building and constructing and creating. And we say, we didn't know that was this possible with our materials. And the same thing that happened for children with cognitive impairment. When they moved out, they started to construct and showing, is that you? That's amazing. I didn't think that. And they started for all. And what we see currently is anticipation, self-regulation and self-management. And these are issues very important, for example, toileting. You know, we still have disability is disability. We, one child refused to go to the toilet, but we see anticipation also coming in. One boy with Down syndrome, each week he brings two repurposed materials with him to ensure he's allowed to come back. Now that's also a creative movement. You know, he doesn't take something valuable. He takes something that is nothing, a chopstick. But with that, he says, I want to come back. So we see motivation, we see ideation, we see originality, we see expansion, flexibility, relationships, uh, double flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> so for parents, for parents, we saw initially a high attrition rate. We realized it was hard to convince parents. We also saw that a lot of parents said we expected therapy, we expected this, but I would say 50% is quite good. Uh, we also saw parents' apologies for behavior. We tend to apologize so much. We saw gradually coming a strong core support, word of mouth, discussions about the value of play, creativity, parents relating to their struggles, a growing comfort zone, Pre parents bring their children, bring their own work, stepping out for a kettle coffee, parents relating to their children's new enactment, parents confiding. So there is a whole lot what creativity and freedom can do for everybody. And then we have something with the interlocutors. Many, many people think that creativity and play is fun, novel, especially with disabilities. But gradually, they started to discuss the value of play creativity and their role as playmaker, recognition of alternative communication system, recognition of strengths, playmakers relating to their struggles, if there was little progress a search for new ideas, a growing comfort zone with children, a growing interest in research. Now that is what all this does when you take on a very holistic and ecological approach that you get everybody involved. So open minds, open doors. It broadens our knowledge base, what we have. A little bit contribution to what Asia has. Uh, 
we allow for new directions that we involve young children, but including those with disability in the creative creativity debate, because I think that is important. You can't start to be creative when you're 30. It has to start really from very, very, well, it has to start with us now with our attitudes and the value of research and contributing. And yeah, and this is what happens when children come together and play and all the amazing structures they make with just bricks, and these bricks are pretty heavy, they would not be approved under the Early Childhood Act, under Sparks or anything. So far no kid has had these blocks on their toes, so I think it's pretty good. Uh, this is when they come together where you don't look, and how they create and communicate. So, thank you. I have a gift for you all. Are you ready? Yes. You're going to do some making while I speak. <laughs> I'm going to give you each a piece of paper. All right. Now I want you to, it's actually from an origami calendar. Oh. So I want you to resist the side that's got instructions <laughs> and just respond to it. Okay, this is a piece of paper. And I'll be talking about paper whilst you're with the paper. So this is my gift. Sorry. Take one and pass it back. Paper is malleable. Paper has memory. See the creases. Pinched paper, folded paper, poked, scrunched, cut, waxed, torn, transformed paper leaves birds boats nose tower all these possibilities with paper i came to know from observing arts workers in action at the corner at the state library of queensland so i've only been here in singapore since july so i'm presenting research from queensland australia the corner is the State Library of Queensland's dedicated space for under eight-year-olds. It is a glassed corner of the State Library, offering you this fishbowl-like experience <laughs> where the outsiders can look in and the insiders can look out. You enter through the main entrance of the library and weave your way through a maze of single-seater lounge chairs with locals reading newspapers, utilising the free internet curling and bending into the folds of lounge chairs. SLQ's values of providing free and equitable access, sharing and belonging to community are viscerally sensed. Past the lounge chairs, there is a glass display cabinet <laughs> packed with child art, um, adult arts worker co-constructed creations with their accompanying stories as pictured here. You can, um, it is the alive and rich with stories, rich with rawness, rich with the aesthetic of the everyday imaginings of children and artists. Here you can linger and savour the joy expressed in installations such as the Backyard Project and Three Tree Island as pictured on the slide. And you trace these raw installations, you turn a corner, and there's a large television set that you can enter and make live television shows. And then past that, there's a sunken floor framed by tiered seating and a zigzagged ramp filled with the Let's Play House installation of large replicas of homemade play items and varying loose open-ended playthings. So there's these large, like a, um, a car made out of a toilet roll, but you know, massive so you could sit and climb on it to help you imagine. They change the installations at the corner every four months, so three times a year, and they're artist curated um, installations. So here the everyday, the ordinary are magnified. 
What I share with you comes from spending seven days of what Sarah Powell and Margaret Somerville referred to as deep hanging out. So we hung out at the corner with my research colleagues, Roxanne Finn and Catherine Del Zoppo in September 2018 to understand the pedagogies at play between artists, children and families and matter from differing theoretical positions. Our deep hanging out had its roots in anthropology and ethnography and embraced what Donna Haraway referred to as an open curious practice to see what emerges whilst merging with the culture of the corner. Can I just say this is fantastic? <laughs> You're all playing with the paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> whilst being in and with the corner and its inhabitants, we audio recorded conversations with arts workers and visiting families and observed artist, child and family collaborations recorded with poetic note-taking, photos and video. So in what I share with you now, I'm reading the data to explore Jewian questions, drawing from John Dewey's next slide. Here he is, he's an old white bloke, he's no longer around. He wrote a book called Art as Experience in 1934. So it's a long time ago, but his work has been, you know, so resonant in education and in arts and creativity. And what I'm sharing with you is actually an, part of an invited chapter from a companion to the art as experience book that's going to come out um, early next year. So I've got the link to that at the end. Um, so to Jewy creativity occurs through exp expressive acts that begin with an impulsion a response to a need arising from interaction with the environment. So right now you've kind of had this impulse of the responding to the paper, right? And from the impulsion, there are invariably obstacles, challenges, and curiosity is generated and ideas to overcome the obstacles where you draw from prior experiences and experimentation. Impulse meeting environment, okay? So to animate and ignite wonder in the space, the corner, they roster on arts workers and program assistants on a daily basis. The arts workers are entities in the space to extend the invitation of playfulness and exploration with matter. The arts workers offer materials and shared attention with matter, space and relationality without coercion. They are a living part of the installation. They invite and respond to interactions with others with materials. Artists make with loose parts and spontaneity, marveling at organicity and vitality. On focusing on the aesthetic, as Dewey describes, emphasis falls in the constant rhythm that marks the interaction of the live creature and his surroundings. An artist's thoughts are immediately embodied in the object as is illustrated by Tiffany, one of the arts workers' reflections on the baby mats she makes for the corner. So here's one of them. So it morphs into so many different things, she says. I never ever in my biggest dreams ever thought a baby mat could be so engaging with so many people and how they would treat that or utilize it. And it's used for story, it's used for sleeping, it's used for play. It's amazing, all the different permutations of it. And during our research at the corner, the baby mat, um, yeah, here as pictured is this large, soft sculptural bath. So it's about the size of two double beds with handmade bath toys dispersed. And the artist's offering of embodying the object is resonant in this grandmother's sharing. She said to me, last time I came, I lay in the bath and my grandson scrubbed me from head to toe with every object in there. Now, what other kind of public space could you do that in? <laughs> the corner provides the liveliness of art as experience. I embrace this liveliness through what Sarah Pink refers to as sensory ethnography and Jane Bennett as vital materialism. So no walls are built around matter and artists. They are there to be interacted and made with. I share with you experiences that aroused my interest and afforded me enjoyment, such as Dewey argues for recognition of. 
whilst I spent time looking and listening and being with the corner and all its parts. These are memorable moments of pleasure, all in making with paper. And through these encounters, I asked Dewey's questions. How is it that the everyday making of things grows into that form of making which is genuinely artistic? And how is it that our everyday environment of scenes and situations develops into the peculiar satisfaction that attends the experience, which is emphatically aesthetic? I then ask what are the material literacies, so drawing from Kate Pahl and Hugh Escott's work on materialising literacies, that is how language and literacy practices intersect with the material world that occur in this state-funded cultural institution, which is known as a, a knowledge bank and a vital community source, as much as a physical as well as virtual place for sharing, learning, collaborating and creation. To remove construction of aesthetic as distant, elite, from distant far lands, but to be with the everyday, in the ordinary, I particularly look to the live creature of paper. Mm -hmm. Attending to its malleability, its memory, its transformability, its shapes, its forms and its textures, its sustained vitality from its tree history. I attuned to the vitality of the experience of making with paper. So I'm going to share with you now two vignettes of artists and children making with paper, proposed as what Dewey would describe as art as experience encounters that unfold material literacies, create publics and political action to reconfigure libraries as community hubs beyond print literacy agendas. Story one. Walter and paper boats. Walter gathers paper and crayons at the patch on the floor by the top tiered timber bench. Crayons are rubbed onto A5 pieces of paper. Walter demonstrates rubbing with the side, the tip and the angle of the crayon to give different width mark making. Five children aged three to eight and two adults all lean in to watch and learn as you see here. Walter then pulls out his keys from his pocket and scratches lines into his crayon coloring. I couldn't find anything else in the storeroom, so I could pass around my keys to etch lines. He then looks at a grandparent watching and remembers, you put me onto coins another time. And he puts his hand into his pocket searching for a coin. But in today's cashless society, I do not have a <laughs> coin. Another arts worker suggests, use your credit card. <laughs> Walter pulls out his credit card and tries itching with it. Then he shares, I just noticed something. All of your colouring is more solid than mine because you are colouring on rubber, whereas I'm leaning on wood. So it seems colouring on rubber is better. The children and the adults stop colouring and look at the difference. Mm -hmm. Sebastian then scrunches up his crayon paper. To create and destroy is totally acceptable. That is what I learnt from Walter another time, says Sebastian's grandmother. Then she says, do we need to colour the other side? Walter explains, this is what we are making. And you could go to the next slide. And he shows folded paper boots. So to make it waterproof with the wax, yes, we need to colour both sides, at least the middle part that touches the water. Okay, it's now time to start folding. It is much easier to fold if you have three hands. Do you have three hands? <laughs> the children all look frowned and puzzled and go, no. And then, then adults try to offer one of their hands and <laughs> oh well. The bench is going to be your third hand, says Walter. What we are doing is nautical engineering. We are building a boat. So we have to take care to do this properly. We have to make the bow and the stern, nautical speak for the front and the back of the boat. The folds have to be parallel and they have to be the same direction as the bottom line. 
Axel, one of the children, then walks around to the other side of the bench as he sees it will be a better height for him to lean to fold a more suitably proportioned third hand. Walter explains, paper is malleable. Paper has memory. This boat is going to be symmetrical. Whatever we do on this side, we also do on the other side. If you launch the boat from a really high bridge, holding it at both ends, the boat usually lands the right way up. Walter generatively shares material knowledge of paper and paper boats. The children are mesmerized with rubbing wax crayons and paper, folding to Walter's nautical instructions. They patiently wait in for the instructions, carefully attending to the boat making sequence. Walter is a tall German crazy artist. He presents somewhat like a caricature of a mad professor. And on referring to the front and the back of the boat, the children, you know, as bow and stern, they, you know, collapse with laughter. <laughs> no boat by making boat. Material literacies of paper, rubber, wood, keys, coins, cards, crayons and boats come to be known exploratory, playfully and communally. Walter says, I've always thought that a good indicator of good artwork is that children like it because I'm not for the, and slightly su suspicious of the kind of artwork that is really only unlocked through intellect or on a thinking level. Such challenging of the elitism that is often associated with art aligns with Dewey's pragmatism and focus on experience of the everyday, of the ordinary, with insight and wonder. Story two, Tim, Big Nose and the Tower of London. <laughs> Alongside the ma making bench by, out by outside window, performing artist Tim shreds up strips of paper then tapes pieces together at one end, playfully suggesting to two girls making eyebrows <laughs> or dragon fire <sighs> or a hula skirt. Aloha. <laughs> ah, in fact, it is tentacles of a jellyfish. And in his making and imagining frenzy, an irregular shaped piece of paper drops to the floor. One girl notices it declaring, it looks like a big nose. Tim instantly colors the nose red and sticks two eye stickers on it and colors the bottom black for trousers. Ta-da, big nose. Then he grabs his ukulele and starts to sing a crazy song about big nose and big nose's friends, bringing the two girls into the adventures of big nose. Then he invites me to hold a piece of blue furry fabric stretched out to create a seascape as he sang this story of a jellyfish in the sea with paper jellyfish. Later, Tim comes to know that one of the girls used to live in London and misses it. So he grabs available paper, which is just so happens to be the brochure from the library, and pulls out the pages apart and folds it and tapes it to remodel it into rectangular prism then draw some small windows and cuts and draw spires. There you are, the Tower of London, so you're not so homesick. A beaming smile spreads across the girl's face. The paper jellyfish reappears, shaking next to the girl's ears. Jellyfish earrings, perhaps, Tim offers. <laughs> Wild, curly-haired Tim animates paper and spreads joy. Tim says, like there's a piece of paper and eight times out of 10, they'll go scribble, scribble, scribble. And then they'll go get another piece of paper and go scribble, scribble, scribble. But then if you can go to them and say, what, what is that? Then go, oh, it's something. Oh, you, you start a narrative. But then you go, it hasn't got any eyes. So they put eyes on it and you're building a character. And then you go, but what does it do? Swims, but where? It swims in the ocean, like that. Yeah, but there's a suspense. Shark in the water, going to eat it. What's it gonna do now? So you're building a story. It's not just joy for joy's sake, but joy in imagining. Tim with paper cultivates children's capacity to imagine. We've got to get a generation of kids to grow up using their imagination. So they'll use it as an adult 
It's no good using it as a kid, then to say, no, you don't use that anymore. You've got to use it, use it as a tool. It's a wonderful opportunity for human beings to keep themselves happy and in balance with the world and nature and be empathetic. You learn empathy by being imaginative. Storytelling is widely understood to have a unique capacity to cultivate sympathetic imagination, to imagine another's perspective and build a greater understanding of the complexities of humanity. For example, if you see Clarissa Pinkola Este's work and Martha Nussbaum's. And I start to wonder, is this the theorizing of experience that Dewey proposed in his question? How is it that the everyday making of things grows into that form of making which is genuinely artistic? If, as Vincent van Gogh is quoted to have written, I feel that there's nothing more genuinely artistic than to love people, then building empathy through nurturing imagination is artistic, empathetically aesthetic, linking to Dewey's second question I had. Artist's experience insinuates possibilities of human relations not to be found in rule and precept, but rather by being truly present in the moment and unleashing the imagination to flow. So through attention, to the interaction of live creature with environment, the very process of living as Dewey defines, I came to know the vibrancy and vitality of paper, the joy of snipping paper, gluing paper, folding paper, shaping, touching, scrunching, tearing, coloring, and animating paper. I sense paper's vibrant materiality through the ideas and hands of artists. As Vital materialist Jane Bennett notes, Dewey helps us to see the effective bodily nature of human responses. And here I've shared a brief moments where all present were intensely focused on responding to paper. Paper becomes more than its predetermined, socially constructed use through artists making with paper. And children came to know materialities of paper and accompanying paper in a space fertile for making, for communality. Attention to material literacies offers a better chance of engaging in more ethical and socially just practices by including a broader spectrum of meaning making beyond the privileged written word. And it gives access to broader communities, right? Like what Esther was speaking. Woven with imagination, aesthetics, and communality. The invigoration of material literacies in an institution that is known as a collection of printed, preserved, and ordered papers, such as books, periodicals, newspapers, may be read as political. Political in the deeper sense of the word, that is being able to negotiate diverse views and interests for the sake of accomplishing some public task. Artists reconfigure paper in a library. Dewey acknowledges that a political action need not originate in human bodies at all. And so I wonder, does the political action of reconfiguring the library as a family hub, as an exploratory communal making space, initiate in the vitality of paper? Paper catalyzes a public it provides an impulse to make, to create. Artist enhanced awareness of the materialities of paper is a political act that changes what people can see in the possibilities of paper, in the possibilities of making with paper, in the possibilities of joyous intergenerational activity. And I see that artists such as Tiffany, Walter and Tim cultivating a culture that is inextricably enmeshed with non-human agencies such as paper, glue, crayons, sticky tape, etc., to work together to bring joy, knowing and imagining. The beauty and real value are in the artists who subtly and indirectly catalyze publics, material literacies, imagination and community through being child-centric and sensorily relating with matter. In the corner, I witnessed that by providing a space for playful making with no rules, preset, Admon admonition and administration, that access and interest in art making happened whilst also ripening material literacies, aesthetics and imagination. Thank you.
Okay, so the very first one that came up is fascinating. Why is it that people value creative ideas, yet when a creative idea is presented, people tend to revert back to safe alternatives? <laughs> Who would like to, to take that one? Um, I have. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think there's sort of different uh, uh, capacities for uh, extension and discomfort conflicting with one another. <laughs> I mean, um, I think it depends on the context to what degree people can sit with that discomfort. I just think in education we don't do it particularly well. Um, I think we're not structured that way in education, um, at all levels of education, at least in the, to the degree that it, um, the degree to which it starts to become measured and assessed, right? And uh, I was recently with colleagues in New York who were talking about baby pizza is being introduced mm -hmm. now. I'm not sure if you have heard, uh, but uh, you know this measurement system of measurement is just going younger and younger and younger. So I think um, you know. Uh, some people talk about the arts and some people talk about innovation as being like right on that edge between what is excitingly new but not too far avant-garde to be unintelligible. So uh, I, I don't think there's an answer to the question but I, I think it's a tension that we all live with. I just wish education could make room for sitting more fluidly with that tension. Well, I actually think it's also about the safety. It's about, there's this very nice book, which uh, it's a storybook, I Have an ID. You know, whereby it actually, it's a children's book, but where it grows on you. But we don't give room to grow. Mm -hmm. I think it's also with the safety of the environment. I don't know, what do you think? I think it's the trust to say it's not ought. Uh, we all want to have that stability. Nothing. We don't embrace the odd. The odd. Well, I don't think we're treating the. I don't think we're treating the environment very safely. Um, Even, you know. Well, because we <laughs> think the environment is there, it will be there forever. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is like right. it's there, but mm -hmm. we are not giving enough thought about the environment in, in that creativity needs an environment to grow. We need to see that. We can, what we see is four walls, but there are hidden tensions, and those hidden tensions are very, very we important. That things are interconnected, I think, in general, right? Yeah, I, I think, I think so. we agree. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'm sure of it. <laughs> I'm an environmental psychologist, so I definitely think environment has a large part to play, and there's that interaction between people and the environments that we're in at all times. And yes. I was thinking when Esther was presenting, uh, the children coming into a particular space can actually affect the way that they would interact yeah. as you found. Yeah. But it so, took mm. time. It yes. takes time. So within my standards, which I designed for education, I have four levels. Uh, I have four levels. First is exploration. The second one is engagement. The third level is ex experience. And the last one is, is then enhancement. And this is taken very much from Bruner, from a novice yeah. to expert. That's but right. we need allowance for creativity to grow. <laughs> it is something that starts with a little child for the first time put a block, first you throw your banana from the high, high chair, mm -hmm. then you throw your block in the toilet. Now, then you start having different things. It is all that cause and effect. Uh, it is about knowing what is acceptable in innovation mm -hmm. and not acceptable. You know, blocks in the toilet were not acceptable for me, but, uh, well. Naive scientists at the play. <laughs> Can we, can we go to another question? Uh, to an educator, uh, sorry, this one, yeah. To an educator, it is an open-ended and low-cost play. How can adults or Singapore society accept this as a basic tool of creativity? Singapore is going to have to answer that. Do you want to answer? <laughs> so, so can you exactly, because it was a long question, and I think we want to break it up. OK, to an educator, it's, it's open-ended and low-cost yeah. play. Yeah. yeah. So how can adults or Singapore society accept this as a basic tool of creativity? I think it is, I don't want to put it 
textual in in Singapore. I think com ever commercialism is ruling creativity. I have worked in a region with the very poor, and I think creativity is innate in and it exists when there is a problem. Mm -hmm. The moment you have spending power, you're also at risk of losing your creativity. Uh, it is for us now, with increasing materialism, how can we still maintain it? And that is the question. So I don't think it's Singaporean, it's Australian, it's American, mm -hmm. uh, it may be, maybe Louise, mm -hmm. because your simple paper. I know. <laughs> That's what I was just going to say, having public spaces with loose, open parts available. Mm -hmm. You know, that's access for all ages, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so often the playgrounds are, you know, these modular sets with just single use. Mm -hmm. So we need public spaces with just loose items. Mm -hmm. And it's everywhere. Yeah. You're losing mm -hmm. it wherever there's urbanization. Mm -hmm. And What's perhaps it? that's what, I don't know if, what the intention of for the person who wrote that, but <laughs> I assume nowadays we seem to be expected to spend so much on toys and things for mm -hmm. children. And here's something low cost. Can adults take it up? Children probably accept it very readily. Mm. You know, if when we were kids, if my parents bought home when something, some kind of appliance in a box, we were playing in the box within, yeah. you know, yeah. as soon as Everybody it was unpackaged. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well. And sometimes if they gave us a toy, we'd prefer to play with the box. Yeah. <laughs> so many more things to do with it. Yeah. Let's move to another question. To what extent does socialisation play a role in developing innovation and creativity within individuals? And it's got a second part. And how could uh, how could early socialisation develop creativity? Mm. I'll go. Um, yeah, you certainly need to develop the the culture of creativity, and I suppose I will speak from my longest arts practice as a storyteller. That you know, through story, it cultivates the imagination, and that you you share you know stories with children from you know, as soon as you're engaging with them with language. You know, the babes in arms, you can be sharing stories, and it's because you're just hearing. So you have to imagine, and you know, so that it becomes part of the way that you do things, that you do things together, um, and you're, you know, always, yeah, drawing from your imagination and going, I wonder. That could be just even having that as a phrase. I wonder if. <laughs> and I wonder if you'd like to comment on that as well, because you talked about silos. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a very different world when you get past primary level um, in education. It just the la you know the stakes change. I think that um, I wrote a book in 2014 called The Creative Turn. Um, it was up on the slide, the pink book, um, and it, that book talks about the commodification of creativity, what I called the, the commodification of creativity, and I felt that it was a cultural turn, a global cultural turn, which was, you know, like we've always played and we, we've always imagined and I, I believe we've always told stories and we, we do inherently understand the value of that for our well-being, for connecting, for making sense of our lives and our communities. But what's happened in my view is that um, those practices have become commodified and materialized in a way that they have to be profitable now and so even artists are required to take entrepreneurial uh, classes in order to qualify for funding and things like that so the idea that um, the arts or creativity has some inherent cultural value um, has gone away and the capitalist principle that everything must be profitable in a society I believe has taken over and therefore the kinds of creativity, whether it be arts or in STEM or whatever, in secondary school context and to some degree tertiary ones as well, has, has similarly been commodified. So is it a question of how do we do it? How do we socialize into it? I personally don't think that's the question. I think we all know that. Um, I, I think that w what we've done is commodify it, not desocialize it. We've done it before, we're still doing it, but the stakes are different. Um, and just in the, in the curriculum, I mean, my, my, my current study and my previous research, you know, it looks a lot at different national curricula all around the world, and this um, joining up of creative and critical thinking is, is also just like on a micro level, on that assessment micro policy level, is quite an interesting move, right? Because creativity isn't critical thinking. They're not interchangeable. 
you can talk about the relationship between them, but in, a work, in the workplace, critical thinking is very, and in the education system, critical thinking is very important. So it ties it to something else. It's just like you'll never hear about creativity on its own in creative economies or cultural industries. You hear about creativity and innovation, mm -hmm. because innovation is profitable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is the poison. So I wonder if part of socialisation is that's how we learn skills, but for creativity, as you say, it's not so much skills-based. Mm. Sometimes I wonder if, if children nowadays are, are used to the idea of actually being comfortable with being alone, because mm, we're expected right. to socialise all the time, and yet, yeah. uh, again, when okay. I was growing up, I spent a lot of time alone because I was the last of eight yeah. children, wow. and I was quite comfortable in yeah. being alone. And yes. I, so many people now seem to worry that if you're alone, there's something wrong with you. Absolutely. And well, and we're not alone even when we are alone, yeah. right? Because everybody's on a device. Yes, yeah. You're never yeah, alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. comfortable with that. That's yeah. sometimes where that spark of creativity might mm. occur yeah. if you can let it happen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So that's like in my previous study, which was about creativity in secondary schools in four countries, like one of the things that even at the principal level, they said they couldn't, they were powerless to alter the timetable to give students time to uh, uh, imagine, think, daydream, all of which are indicated in numerous uh, evidence-based research about creativity. Um, they, they, they felt powerless, even at that principal level, to alter the, the structural things that they that they could, that we might think that they could, um, um, to make time for something that wasn't productive, yeah. right? So there's the alone part of it, and then there's just everything has to have a purpose. And the purpose has to have an outcome that's measurable. And so I think in secondary education, which is my primary focus, secondary and tertiary, we, we don't allow that downtime that both of you were talking about in your presentations, which is, you know, a different notion of product, productive mm. yeah. or va valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially, and here I want to highlight uh, on the local context, children are now going to put in, be put in uh, infant care from six weeks. Infant cares have mushroomed so much. Uh, every, uh, the kindergartens are virtually non-existent. So uh, 10 years ago, 60% was kindergarten, 40% was childcare, now it's the other way around. 80% is actually childcare. Mm -hmm. Kindergartens cannot move on. Um, then every primary school now has uh, student care. Uh, it means for children, they're never alone. Mm -hmm. uh, they are. They have to poop and pee together, brush teeth together. There is not even a privacy to fart. Now, <laughs> and I'm, I mean, it's really true. Um, and so, what does that mean for your development? What does it mean for you as a person that you have never been surrounded by your own thoughts? And children are now into mm. child cares, infant cares from seven to or to 7.30 or longer. Those are long hours. Taking into, co into consideration one hour before they go to infant care, mm -hmm. one hour after. I hear horrific stories even of parents don't changing their infants at night, keep bringing them home in a nappy and returning them in the same nappy. Um, oh. So there is no time for stories, bonding. Um, so there are things going on. Even in my research, issues of playmakers hovering over a child are not as bad as not having any moment for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think we have serious thought, mm -hmm. serious, serious thought. Mm -hmm. Esther, can we move into another question that's uh, along in your line of work here? How can we instill creativity in individuals across the line of class, race, ethnicity, and gender? And how can creativity be instilled in an inclusive manner under those circumstances? Okay, if I answer that question, <laughs> I'll be the richest woman in town. <laughs> Let me tell you, I can write a whole series of books and sell it. You can't sell creativity. You can't have a right answer. You can only come together through dialogue, through real thinking together, but also think deeper about what it means to be human. And I think Dewey brings thoughts. There are so many thoughts that are brought. It, it Don't spend too much of time on thinking, though, but uh, it's good 
just to sit down and, and say, am I doing this the right way? What is the effect 10 years from now? Yes, we say education equalizer. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think equalizer is a sec uh, education is a segregator. I believe we have to go back to the old-fashioned playground whereby I see parents coming together, sitting on the side, mm -hmm. talking. I think we need to move away mm -hmm. from consumerism, materialism. Doesn't mean you have to give away all your things, but be more sensible when you buy something. Does it serve a purpose? We eat too much, we buy too much. We, <laughs> you know, we are just yeah. living in yeah. a very generous for ourselves. So I think, let's get back to basics. Listen to the sound of the birds, the heart. Uh, listen to your heartbeat. Start with simple things in life. You know, sing a song, listen to your own voice. What is, uh, look at how you walk, dance. Listen to your senses, start smelling, and start being who you are. And that's the only advice I can give. Thanks for referring to uh, junk, Esther, because we have our final question relation to this one. So in relation to a creative environment, so many children now um, play or creating, but they're using recycled items now, junk play. Mm -hmm. So uh, Louise, you might like to comment on this one. Is it baseless for that? Does it, does it have a meaning and you're purpose? Taking away the food. <laughs> <laughs> to be able you're to play with junk. <laughs> Is there a purpose to playing with junk? Is there? It wasn't quite a, a question. So yeah, okay. Kind of yeah. okay. <laughs> um, well, we have too much junk, right? <laughs> we are creating massive, you know, piles of landfill. So, you know, why not use these materials? Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, we have, I've been asking my students about this. Um, in Australia, we have something called reverse garbage, where industries will, you know, take, um, they're, they're offcuts, they're scraps, and then they are used for creative yeah. projects. And I've been trying to work out, you know, is there something here in Singapore? Mm. Doesn't sound like it there is. is. There it's is. Coming up. Oh, it's and coming. You're and making and it. Play and we are using all. We don't have budget for our creative yeah, yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're actually using everything that can be repurposed, furniture, stuff, whatever. But we also use all the, well, you saw the, the blocks. Those blocks actually were from pellets. You know, the, the blocks in between the pellets, and we painted them. And uh, see, there's a whole lot you can do. And those PVC pipes, which you use for, for uh, there's an awful lot that we can remake and redo. Yeah, so I think that's a good start for a dialogue. Start yeah. with actually things first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. stop the consumerism. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Oh, I better use this one. yeah. Now, yeah. can you use hold that one for me, please? Mm -hmm. Okay. So thanks to all our presenters. Uh, help me show a round of applause for our presenters and. <laughs> thanks to our audience members for giving such wonderful questions.